Hello and welcome to my Astronomy Nights. I'm Derek and in this video I'm looking at the wonderful Cocoon Nebula IC5146. Now the Cocoon Nebula is located within that large summer constellation of Cygnus right up in the Lacerta border and it's really interesting because there's a grouping of a few deep sky objects together. You have a lovely young open cluster of Colander 470 and those stars then are exciting and reflecting off the gases to create the Cocoon Nebula and that's all housed within a dark nebula of Barnard 168. So let's take a look and see where we can find this one. So to locate IC5146, it's a busy part of the sky with all those stars in the Milky Way, but we can use Deneb and Alpha Lacerte to find a halfway point which gets us to Mesia 39, a lovely little open cluster. And then we want to go draw a line between Mesia 39 and 6 Lacerte, and move four degrees in that direction and you'll come across a little parallelogram of magnitude 10 stars and then on the northern end of those there's the two magnitude 10 stars plus one more magnitude 10 star and they draw a little line underneath the cocoon nebula and you'll see that nice little haze and a gray little circular cloud sitting against the dark nebula in the background and that's the cocoon nebula So the Cocoon Nebula or IC5146 is located in the constellation of Cygnus up beside Lacerte and it's a lovely uh, reflecting emission nebula. It's got a magnitude of about somewhere around magnitude 9.5 and it has a size of 10 by 11 arc minutes. There's a little central star at the middle which is about 14 solar masses and that's creating the excitation of the hydrogen gas with its ultraviolet radiation but the starlight is also reflecting off some of that gas to give it that kind of blue element that runs with the reds. It's all sitting then against that lovely dark background of Barnard 168 and it's a really really interesting target visually and for photographs. This one was it has a few discoverers attributed to it. You have E.E. E. Barnard and Max Wolf and Espen who would all were taking photographic plates in the late 19th century. They're all described as large and bright with a lovely central star of magnitude 9.5. So when I was researching the Cocoon Nebula, I found a few different versions of how bright it was, the size and the diameter. So the, the, the brightness of the nebula itself ranged from 7.2 to 10. We had a distance then again that was ranging from 2,500 light years to 4,000 light years. Now you'd be tending to find the distance at more around the two and a half thousand light years because the open cluster of Colander 470 is in or around the two and, a, two and a half thousand light years as well, just plus or minus for those stars. The real diameter then, uh, given the fact that it could be 10 to 12 arc minutes uh, on the sky, gives it in or around 15 light years of a diameter of that gas itself. Barnard 168 is a dark nebula discovered by E.E. E. Barnard when he was running his photographic plates of the Milky Way. This one is quite large, it's nearly two degrees long by about a quarter of a degree in width along the way. It goes from the Cocoon Nebula in the direction of Messier 39. You'll pick it up in binoculars on a good, if you have a good dark site where you can see the Milky Way, you'll see this one quite obviously. You won't see the Cocoon Nebula in, in binoculars, but you will pick up this dark nebula. Now also in the same region then we have a uh, colander 470 which is a lovely little young open uh, cluster of stars that's housed within the cocoon nebula. Some of these are, are actually causing those excitations of the hydrogen gas and reflecting off the gas to create the nebula itself. You have that central star which is about 14 solar masses creating the um, uh, ultraviolet radiation that's exciting that hydrogen gas. Don't forget my data on the Cocoon Nebula, I was using my monochrome camera and I had my RGB filters on it. I gave two hours of data per colour channel, so I had a total of six hours in to combine. Um, the green channel wasn't very good because I was getting a lot of fog at the end, but luckily enough my red and blue were the first two in order, so I was able to get a good image out of it with those two channels. Um, it's a really interesting target when you get, get start editing your photo because it has some lovely little dark lanes running through it and then having that dark background of Barnard 168 it makes for a really interesting edit as well. Now observing this target 
it was really interesting. I'd never observed the cocoon before. I'd always associated this with being a photographic target rather than an observing target. So it was the first time I decided to give it a look. It's in a tricky little position for me for my latitude because it's really high up. So it took a while to star hop around just with that Altaz uh, Dobsonian mount. But uh, eventually I was able to reweight the telescope and get it into a comfortable position. And once I saw it, then I was surprised at how large it was at that 10 by 11 arc minutes. And it showed up really nicely against the, the um, dark nebula in the background. Now, one thing I, I didn't think to look for when I was observing it, because I was getting my photo data at the same time, was that lovely little silhouette of the galloping horse that's running through the nebula. I'd never noticed it before because I'd always observed photos from the other orientation. But just when you turn it up, you can just see that kind of silhouetted shape. So the next clear night I have, I have to go back to this one now and see if you can observe any of those dark little elements to create that shape. Because I was able to see them individually as I was looking, you could see those dark parts, but I never thought to look for that overall effect within the nebula. So for my observing session, I used solely my 12 inch Dobsonian. And this was my first time photographing and observing the Cocoon Nebula. Um, I had never thought to observe it before because I thought of it more as a photographic target. And I'm very glad that I decided to put the 12 inch on it because it's a really nice nebula to observe. The Cocoon Nebula looks really good at about 50 power and it has a really lovely contrast against the dark nebula in the background. It's quite faint but it holds up quite well and it's so well positioned it's practically overhead and uh, makes it difficult to track with a 12 inch manual Dobsonian but I, it made for a fantastic view once I got the telescope weighted correctly. It holds up really well at about 90 power so that was using my 16 millimeter Nirvana eyepiece and it gave it a nice contrast with that dark background. It, it looked really well in my wider field eyepiece as well, but I felt that that was the most detail that I could pull out of it. There's some lovely dark elements within it and in around that central star, and there's a couple of fainter stars to the south, and um, you can kind of track those dark lanes. I didn't realize until I went editing my photo that the dark lanes all make this silhouette of like a galloping horse and I really want to get out onto it again the next clear night and see if I can actually see that silhouette. So all in all, I think the Cocoon Nebula is a wonderful target to track down both for visual and for running your telescope on it for a photo. The data came out really well. I really enjoyed getting my color data on this one solely. I stayed away from getting a monochrome image because I wanted to get a little better at my color editing. And this is a fabulous target. I'm really surprised. I'd never observed it, observed it before and I'd never photographed it before. And it's a definite target to return to because it has so much detail within it. Please let me know how you get on with your observations and your photographs in the comment below. And do tell me if you're able to observe that lovely little silhouette of the galloping horse within the Cocoon Nebula. Until next time, clear skies.